I mean, I started looking into the disappearance of a little girl and the story that unraveled, I definitely was not expecting. Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. And if you're new to my channel, hello, my name is Gabby and welcome. If you've never been here before, never watched any of my videos, have no idea what I do here on my channel, I cover true crime cases and all the cases that I cover, little bit older they're all basically 20 years or older so if that's something that you might be interested in maybe go down below click that subscribe button and also make sure to turn on the post notifications to be notified every time that i upload so today's video is definitely a twisty one with a lot of layers to it a couple weeks ago while looking into different cases online i came across the photo of this adorable little girl named Catherine who disappeared in 1973. as i dove more into her case it led into the disappearance of two other children, the proven death of one, and an entire story revolving around a cult and its corrupt cult leader. This video does contain details of abuse, mostly to children, so do keep that in mind before watching the rest of this video. Most of my research came from a 2018 write-up done involving first-hand accounts of what happened. That source and all my other sources will be linked down below. I think this story is one that deserves to be talked about. It deserves some more recognition and I'm making this video with nothing but respect for anyone who went through what I'm getting ready to talk about. With all that being said, let's get right into it. going to start this one off with the first disappearance which revolves around the girl that I was just speaking about, Catherine. Catherine Barbara Davidson was born on December 13th of the year 1966 in Chicago, Illinois. During 1973, she was six years old, standing at three feet, 10 inches tall and weighing about 70 pounds. She was a bubbly young girl with so much energy who just loved being a kid. According to her sister, Joy, one thing she also loved was her Raggedy Ann doll. The day in discussion is September 1st of 1973. And on this day, her family packed up their vehicle and headed to Warren Dunes State Park in Sawyer, Michigan. This family of hers consisted of her, her five other siblings, her father Robert, and her stepmother Anna. As for Catherine's biological mother, I really couldn't find any information online regarding her. Catherine on this day supposedly had her hair in braids and was wearing a white blouse, blue shorts, and white sandals. Warren Dunes State Park is about an hour and a half drive from Chicago, Illinois, where her family was from. According to Michigan.org, Warren Dunes State Park provides 1,952 acres of recreational opportunities along the beautiful shore of Lake Michigan in southwestern Michigan. The rugged dune formation rises 260 feet above the lake and offers spectacular views and excellent for hang gliding. The park has three miles of shoreline, six miles of hiking trails, and is open year round. Warren Dunes State Park sounds like a great place to take the family for a day out. And I'm sure Catherine's family may have been there before, but would this family outing simply be a cover up for what actually happened that day? As the story goes though, the family arrived at the dunes and Robert and Anna start unloading the vehicle. As they're unpacking everything, the six children decide that they're going to explore an area called Painterville Drain, which is basically a canal that drains right into Lake Michigan. Apparently about 15 minutes or so pass and the children make their way back to the family's vehicle. There's one problem though. There were only five children that showed back up to Robert and Anna. Catherine wasn't there. In my brain while researching, I was basically like, okay, well, what did the children say happened? Did she get hurt somewhere? Did someone come up and take her? Or was it a situation where they just like looked around and she just simply wasn't there? That is really nowhere online. It's basically just the kids arrived back at the car without their sister, Catherine, and they basically just said, oh, she must have got lost on the way back. The family supposedly looks everywhere around the area and cannot find Catherine anywhere. And then authorities are called and a huge search is done. During this search, they find nothing in relation to the little girl. The only thing they came across was a green pair of underwear, but it was never proven if this pair of underwear had any solid connection to Catherine. The six-year-old girl 
was missing and people were searching high and low for her everywhere they could think of. You would think that out of everyone, it would be the little girl's father and stepmother who were the most worried about her. Nope. It was said that both of them were very nonchalant about the entire situation. They weren't putting in much effort to find her. They didn't seem worked up about her disappearance. It almost seemed like they just wanted the entire situation to be swept under the rug. Not only that, but it was also said that only three days into the search for Catherine, the couple was spotted in a station wagon around two to three in the morning with another couple, and they were all just talking and laughing and drinking and just having a good old time, like they didn't have a care in the world. Which, honestly, while researching into this, that kind of reminded me a lot of how Casey Anthony was out partying while her daughter was still missing. It looked suspicious and authorities had their eyes narrowed in on Robert and Anna. But as time went on, it was obvious there was nothing they could really do. Catherine was missing, there was no evidence of foul play, and the children were all sticking to their stories. That she just got lost. There was really nothing police could do and Catherine's disappearance became a cold case with almost no leads. What allegedly happened to Catherine would come out decades later, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Back to the Davidson family. Years would pass and the family moved around a little bit. They had moved to Georgia. While in Georgia, Robert and Anna had a daughter named Joy. In the early 1980s, while still in Georgia, the two of them, with the help of Robert's father formed a strict religious group called the House of Prayer for All People. And then they moved it to Florida to a rural area called Micanopy, which is the oldest inland town in the state. And I mean, it is rural, it is small, its population at the beginning of 1980 was only about 737 people. It was a town literally dubbed the name the town that time forgot. Robert and Anna were not very religious before Catherine went missing, but after she did, their devotion to religion would skyrocket, and in the most frightening way. It was almost like they originally turned to God as a distraction and hope to be saved because of a horrible deed they did. You'll kind of see what I mean in a little bit. This religious group, though, followed primarily the beliefs of the Old Testament of the Bible. Robert and Anna decided that with the start of this group, it was also time to completely reinvent themselves. They started with their names. Robert changed his name to Jonah Young, and Anna kept her first name but became Anna Young. They launched this group in a small church on Wakahuda Road, and within no time, outsiders from the area wanted to join. Now, if you wanted to join this group, there were a lot of rules you had to follow. You had to follow a kosher diet. You had to wear robes that went down to the floor and you had to cover your head. And anything Robert and Anna said, you had to do. At the beginning of this group, it was a little strict, but it did seem on the outside like possibly there were good intentions in some aspects of it. Anna, for instance, would pray with people. She'd listen to people's problems, kind of like their therapist, and they would take in children and families who had nowhere else to go. As time passed though, things became stricter and it was becoming apparent that this wasn't just your everyday group of people following the teachings of the Bible. This was a cult a cult that became so much more evil when its male leader, Robert, or Jonah, died in March of 1988 after being crushed by a pickup truck he had been working under. After Robert died, Anna took over. At this group's largest, it had reached 24 members. Throughout time, throughout its years of being active, its numbers kind of fluctuated because people would come in, people would leave, people would die. Most of its members though were recruited in immoral ways such as taking people from nursing homes or rehab centers or taking in children from parents who couldn't afford to take care of them. Anna kind of preyed on individuals who were in living situations they didn't want to be in and she promised them better living situations being a part of this group. One of the main types of people she would supposedly target were single mothers. So of course people would want to join and after they joined she would 
basically completely brainwash them. A lot of the information surrounding the group and the evil side of Anna Elizabeth Young would be brought forward by her daughter, Joy Fluger, known as Sister Mary in the cult. It was said that Anna became so much more abusive after her husband died, like I said before. Allegedly, when members joined her group, they were forced to hand over all their money to her and change their names. Their names had to be biblical ones and they went by either brother or sister. Most often, people a part of this group or cult were starved, beaten, embarrassed in front of other members and ridiculed. One of her most popular styles of beating was whipping a person 33 times just like Jesus supposedly was before being crucified. She didn't treat her members like family, like loved ones. She treated them like they were below her, like they were sinners who needed to be punished and like they were never doing enough to please her. The punishing was mostly done to children, but she did do it to adult members as well. There was also supposedly one incident where Anna had found a couple having sexual relations on the premises and she ordered the man to cut off his penis and he did and he almost died from an infection over time things only got worse and it wasn't only joy who would tell of the horrible things that happened while a part of this cult the next story comes from a woman named fonda favors fonda was only nine years old when her path crossed with anna young's Fonda's older sister, Sabrina, had met Anna while on a bus and Anna convinced her to come down to their church, more like a compound, and that's exactly what she did. The family went to the property and Anna put on a good show. Fonda, Sabrina, Sabrina's son, and their mother were all fed and treated like family and their mother decided that they should all stay. After Fonda joined the group, her name was changed to Sister Rachel and she was separated from the rest of her family. This was commonly done by Anna. Fonda said that she would be beaten so intensely that no tears would even come out. She became numb to the abuse after a while. Sometime later, there was a confrontation between Fonda's mother and Anna, and this was when Fonda and her mother were able to escape from the group once and for all. They left, but Sabrina decided to stay with her son. It was 1984 at the time, and Anna had completely manipulated Sabrina. According to police reports, Anna had fully convinced Sabrina that a demon was inside of her son. Sabrina's son's name was Marcos Antonio Cruz. There's only one photo of him online, and it is of him as an infant, but in 1984, he was about two to three years old. According to police reports, Anna convinced Sabrina to get rid of her child. They weren't planning on just putting him up for adoption or letting someone they know take him, no. In December of that year, supposedly, Sabrina and another member of the cult flew all the way to Puerto Rico and left the toddler on the steps of a Catholic church in a very poor neighborhood. They just left him there. Not only that, but Anna wanted to embarrass this baby, this young child. And she thought that one way to embarrass him would be to put him in a pink dress. So that's exactly what they did. They left him on the steps in a pink dress. Still to this day, it is unknown whatever happened to Marcos Antonio Cruz. I mean, he could still be out there alive. He could have been taken in by somebody. We don't know. Here's an age progression photo done of him by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. At the end of the day, we can only hope he was found by someone and grew up in a loving home and is out there today, still alive and living a happy life. That was the story of what supposedly happened to him. And it was backed up by the individuals involved but it has never been fully confirmed to be true or false. The cult and its evil ways went on for years, but it would pretty much completely fall apart in 1992 when karma finally caught up to its leader. But this wasn't until another horrific incident of abuse occurred. One member of the group was a young girl named Nikki Nicholson, and this girl was left by her parents with the group because she had been doing bad in school and her parents thought that the group would help lead her in the right direction with her education. They put their trust in Anna, who liked to be called Mother Anna, 
but I refuse to call her that. According to the story, randomly one day in 1992, Anna decided that Nikki didn't smell too well and that she needed a bath. Anna filled up a metal tub with very hot water, half a box of Ultra Tide, two caps of coconut scented bubble bath, and bleach. She made Nikki get in the tub and members of the cult held her down in it so she couldn't get out. This poor girl's body would be covered in blisters and she was bedridden afterwards. I can't even imagine the immense pain she would have been in. Having even one blister on your foot after a day of wearing sandals is bad enough. Could you imagine your entire body? The next month after the incident, Nikki's parents were called and told that there had been an accident involving their daughter. When they got to the property, they found their daughter in bed with her hands tied to the bedposts so she couldn't itch or pick at her wounds and make them worse. Nikki was immediately taken by her parents back to South Carolina and she was brought to the hospital nearby where they lived and put in the burn ward. The girl's parents did the right thing and they filed charges against Anna, but within no time, Anna took her daughter Joy and fled the area, leaving her cult behind. Anna and Joy hid from authorities, of course Joy was just a young girl at the time, for about nine years, traveling from place to place, laying low. Well, on November 14th of the year 2000, the National Enquirer ran an article in the paper about Anna telling all about her history, how she was wanted for child abuse and had been put on the FBI's most wanted list. Running that article was successful because before November was up, they located her in an attic in Alton, Illinois. She was put behind bars and served six months for her child abuse conviction. Back in June of 1992, before the fall of the group and what happened to Nikki, someone had came forward with information to police. Marcos would not be the only child to have gone missing as a result of this cult. Catherine's disappearance was one before the cult started. Marcos was in 1984 and in 1988, another child vanished. From the outside world, the small child vanished, but the person that came forward said they knew what actually happened to him. The person who came forward in June of 1992 was a woman named Beatty, previously known as Sharon. She was actually the sister of Robert. This is a photo here of Robert, Anna, Beatty, and Robert and Beatty's father, Joseph Bobo. Beatty, while in the cult, was named Sister Lois, and she witnessed firsthand some of the extreme abuse going on behind the scenes and alleged murder as well. In the late 1980s, there was a baby brought into the group. This baby's name was Iman David Harper, also known as Moses Young, and there is no record of what happened to him. According to Beatty though, she knows what happened. She stated that she was the one assigned to take care of baby Moses. He was only about one or two at the time. Beatty told authorities that she had seen Anna beat him with a stick and starve him for three days. After these beatings, she would lock him away in a closet. Well, after one of his beatings, Beatty went to check on him in the closet. She opened the closet door and found him in a straw hamper. He was covered in wounds and he wasn't breathing. He was dead. Beatty said that after that, her brother brought him outside, still in the little straw hamper, and burned his body. Nothing was done at the time by authorities when it came to what Beatty told them because really there was no evidence. From most of my sources, it makes it seem like as soon as Robert passed away, Anna got increasingly worse with how she was towards the children. And I do believe that, but it seemed like it was, it was pretty bad when Robert was alive as well. Well, from the time that Anna Young was released from being behind bars in 2001 to about 15 or so years later, she lived a pretty secluded life. Joy Fluker was living in Atlanta, Georgia, and Anna, sometime after Joy moved there, moved close by. Anna had apparently gotten remarried and was living under a new last name. She was going by Anna Anderson. One day though, Joy's son runs away from home and he had ran away to his grandmother's home. Joy went over to her mother's home and an argument ensued. Joy did not want her son staying with his grandmother and I'm sure you can't 
blame her. Apparently, Anna had some things to say regarding Joy's parenting and Joy was not having it. They were yelling back and forth and Anna supposedly even darted towards Joy with a metal lamp. Joy, without even thinking twice, blurts out the words, how can you tell me how to raise my children when you killed two children? After she said these words, Anna froze. She was not expecting Joy to say anything like that. Anna screamed back at Joy, calling her a liar. That argument was really what set Joy off on a new mission in life. She went to authorities to talk to them about the little boy from years back that she knew as Moses Young. She wanted justice served for him. So we know Moses was allegedly killed. What other child was killed? There was also another young child said to have died while in the cult. This little girl's name was Katonia, and according to police reports, the little girl's mother was sent to jail for the girl's death, but the girl's brother, John Neal, says it was not his mother who did it. It was Anna. John Neal and his family were a part of the cult. He was a victim to many beatings. He still has marks on his body to this day. John, in his own words, has said, she tortured my little sister she treated her like an animal, of course, speaking of Anna. Before her death, the little girl started having seizures and it was believed that these seizures started because her little body was shutting down due to being so malnourished. Anna apparently believed these seizures, they weren't because she was malnourished or being mistreated, they were a result of her being possessed by the devil. Katonia was prescribed medication for these seizures and it was said that Anna was not buying this medication and not giving it to Katonia and that eventually, because of this, Katonia died. John Neal told The Sun in 2017, people were brainwashed, like the Jim Jones thing. If Anna had said, drink the Kool-Aid, we would have drunk the Kool-Aid. She used fear and she used God. Everybody was going to burn in hell. The kids had demons in them. That's why they got treated so bad. Joy went to the authorities in 2017 and explained everything in great detail, everything she witnessed and the murders of the children. An investigation finally began and it was being led by Alachua County Sheriff's Office cold case investigator, Kevin Allen. Anna Young was arrested on December 1st of 2017. She sat behind bars in the Alachua County Jail. In July of 2020, she was 78 at the time, her bail was set to a whopping $2.5 million. In an article released by Gainesville.com, Chief Assistant Public Defender Bill Miller said, Miss Anna Young is the second oldest individual currently held in the Alachua County Jail. She also has medical conditions that put her at risk for this particular pandemic. Miss Young finds herself charged with perhaps the most unusual set of crimes I've ever worked on and the evidence is similarly unusual. This case is 30 years old and there is no body. The witnesses in this case all have various motives. Anna at the time was suffering from hypertension and kidney disease because she was older in age and the risk of catching COVID was high, they were considering letting her live with one of her daughters in the area. This daughter, whose name is Terrence, said she would make sure her mother was taken care of and would show up to all her hearings, but the court ruled against it, mostly because of the way Anna had fled the area after everything happened with poor Nikki Nicholson. Prosecutor Cass Castillo stated that Anna Young demonstrated that she has an unwillingness to face the responsibilities when she knows police are either after her or have focused their attention on her. They were 100% not going to take a chance on letting her go from under their constant watch, even though she was older in age at the time. On February 17th of 2021, just last year, Anna pleaded no contest to second degree murder for the death of Iman Harper, known in the cult as Moses Young. When it came to Katonia, 
Anna pleaded no contest as well. Anna would be charged with second degree murder and sentenced to 30 years behind bars for the murder of Iman Harper. Another 15 years was supposedly tacked on top of that for a manslaughter charge for the death of Katonia. John Neal, which was the brother of Katonia, said, I feel like we got justice, 100%. I often wondered if I would ever get justice or any accountability. I know God holds people accountable. I knew that was coming, but to be able to see it and live it, it's just wonderful it's a blessing. Anna though would not be behind bars for a very long time because only 42 days into her stay at the Florida Women's Reception Center in Ocala, Florida, she died. She had been taken to the hospital, put in ICU and was on oxygen and ended up passing away at the hospital. So that is the end of Anna's story, but there's still a bit left to tell. I want to make it clear though that going to the authorities with what her mother allegedly did was not easy for Joy, even though she had other past members of the cult to back her up. Three of Joy's siblings, who were never a part of the cult themselves, think Joy was lying about everything. They refused to believe what she said was true about their mother. Her brother stated that he thinks everything is a lie that yes, their mother had disciplined them before, but that he basically doesn't believe it was taken as far as people said it was. He said that he thinks Joy was just seeking revenge on their mother because their mother tried to tell her how to raise her own children. You also might be wondering if anything was ever said about what actually happened to Catherine, who would have been 55 years old in today's time. Authorities have been reinvestigating her disappearance, but Joy says she knows what happened. Now do keep in mind that Catherine disappeared before Joy was even born. Joy said that one of her older sisters told her everything years later, that the family did go to the dunes that day back in 1973, but that Catherine didn't go with them. That by the time they went to the dunes, Catherine was already dead. That going to the dunes was nothing but a cover up. Joy stated she was told that her mother bound and gagged Catherine and put her in the closet. That all night long, Catherine's siblings heard moaning and scratching on the closet door. The next morning, Catherine's sister went to check on Catherine and she wasn't breathing, that Catherine was dead. And as for what happened to Catherine's remains, that is unknown. You know, during that argument, when I said Joy told her mother, you know, how can you tell me how to raise my children when you killed two? If we include Catherine, that would have been three. And we still don't know what happened to Moses. According to Gainesville.com, Joy said, I love my mom. I would support her. I do believe there is an underlying disorder that no one wanted to talk about. I believe that if people had spoken up sooner, her disorder could have been managed and Moses, Katonia, and my sister Kathy, all those deaths could have been avoided. And to top everything off, all of these horrific stories, Catherine was said to not be the first victim of Anna because based on police reports, all the way back in 1968, Anna had also been arrested for child abuse against a five-year-old little girl. I could not find out online though, her relation to this five-year-old little girl though, but based on police reports, there was some child abuse from Anna going on all the way back in 1968. Joy believes that there was something seriously psychologically wrong with her mother and that due to this mental illness being untreated for so long, it stemmed into the horror that it did. A journalist working for the Atlanta Journal Constitution back in 2018 actually went to the abandoned compound where the cult had been all those years back to kind of experience the atmosphere for themselves while they were covering the story. And I can guarantee it was heart-wrenching to know you're standing where so many people experienced trauma in their lives and most of those people were young children. The Atlanta Journal Constitution has reviewed hundreds of reports all in connection to this cult. Art Forgey, a spokesman for the Alachua County Sheriff's Office, was quoted saying, we think there are many, many more. 
we can document other states and other missing children that we believe are tied into this. They ran a religious institution, exercising demons and other things like that. We have documentation involving her clear back to the 60s. We did extensive forensic examination on the property this summer. We are still analyzing the evidence that we gathered. There is still so much to unravel and so many questions that still need to be answered. And I hope within time, the story can have obviously a full resolution. We still don't even know what happened to Marcos. If he is still alive out there, we do not know where Catherine's remains are, if what Joy's sister said actually happened. And of course she deserves a proper burial. If they actually burned poor Iman's body, normal fire is not able to burn bones. So. Where are his bones? Joy said that she is still haunted to this day by the smell of burning flesh from when they burned Iman. Sometimes it becomes so intense, she has to put perfume under her nose. They have dug up the property where the compound was, mostly in search for any of his remains, and they've never come across anything. This entire story is just so sad and my heart, it truly breaks for anyone affected by what happened or were a part of being abused all those years back. From everything I read about Joy, she did the right thing coming forward and I couldn't imagine how hard it was for her to even do that. I'm just happy that some sort of justice was served even though Anna wasn't even behind bars that long when she passed away. I feel like it's just one of those stories where it's like, yay, justice was served, but at the same time, this abuse had went on for so long and because of that innocent children lost their lives. It is not easy to sit and talk about this sort of abuse and murder of children and how it went on for so long. It's not easy but it is a story that I felt deserved to have a video made about it because I haven't really seen many people cover it and there are a lot of videos on YouTube about cults and I, I, this is one that just really wasn't talked about and it's, it's intense. A lot of these stories of cults that I have dove into, whether death was involved or not, it was usually a man in charge and it was kind of this situation where women in the cults were having sexual relations with him and that they kind of looked up to him and worshiped him, but this was a story of a cult ran primarily by a woman. This cult was ran by a mother, somebody who had had multiple children, somebody you would think would have a motherly instinct to them, who would want to cherish and take care of children, and it was so far from that. Before I end this video though, I wanted to give a little bit of a shout out to a nonprofit organization called Our Black Girls. Since 2018, they have been bringing awareness and covering cases of mistreated, missing, and murdered black women and girls in America. I will link their website, Facebook page, Instagram, and Twitter down below if you want to give them a follow and check them out, check out some of the cases that they've covered. They've covered this case and so many others that deserve more attention brought to them. I don't have the biggest platform, but they definitely deserve a shout out. Definitely make sure to go check them out. If you have any comments about this case, make sure to leave those down below in the comments of this video. If you don't have anything to say, maybe just even leave some love for Joy and the others that were affected by what happened. If you have any cases that you possibly want me to cover here on my channel, make sure to send those over to gabby at gmail.com and I will see you all in the next one.